Yo, welcome back to The Breakfast, and it's now time for Off the Press, the segment where we analyze the day's papers, and we have as our guest, Chile Johnson. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. And good morning to our viewers all over the world. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Uh, let's, let's start with uh, stories from the Nation newspapers this morning. Uh, see as many of them we can as we can take. Hopefully, we can squeeze in two of the, these stories before we move to the next one. Um, the, the major one that we can see there on the nation says it's going to be on your screen in a few seconds. Jonathan Jega Wodu and Ogbe disagree on restructuring. Um, we also can find over there, of course, COVID 19 updates on the nation this morning. Um, stolen government property found in Okorocha's warehouse. Wow. Okay. Terrorists didn't overrun military base, says uh, Defense Headquarters, and, and uh, LIRS to employers file tax returns by January 31st. Also, new teacher's retirement age takes effect this month. We also can see there more support for Ondo's quit notice to headers. ARG uh, unions say it's okay. Uh, we can also see here, um, out-of-school children, now 6.8 million, uh, says uh, the federal government, as uh, Deboye clocks 40 as RCCG general overseer. The AFDB forecasts Africa's loss of $409 billion to COVID-19 in two years. And... Um, I think these are the big ones that we will be able to squeeze in. On COVID-19, Elza Zaki's wife test positive in prison. Government to mitigate impact on children. 39 Edo health workers infected in 72 hours. And uh, 4.6 million to get vaccination in Britain. All right. Um, Mr. Johnson, I think, you know, we probably will start with the uh, story on the out-of-school school children. Uh, sometime last year... Um, we were at 10 million or even more than 10 million. And the government says that in one year and seven months, we've been able to reduce our out of school children to just 6.8 million uh, of them through, of course, government programs that have been run so far. So let's start with that. How possible really is it to have sent 3.7, 3.8 million children, you know, back to school in one year? Well, I think um, it's a serious problem that we need to address because any nation that does not um, educate its children is not empowering its youth is is that nation is not prepared for the future uh, because we said our children are the future so if we have that huge amount of children out of school and uh, we are not taking the right steps to address that uh, that situation. It's, it's a serious problem for the society in the future. Um, because, you know, we said, and I do, and is the devil's workshop. If those children are not properly engaged, uh, well, it's, it's clear it's not everyone that can have Western education. And there are areas, if we couldn't train some of them through that, that means, uh, there are vocational schools. Are there other things that you could engage these children to educate them and empower them beyond the normal formal school uh, system? In the past, we used to have those vocational schools, right from kid, from cradle, some just select whatever form of education they want to, to have, that to have technical skills, literary skills, and other skills. So it's a major issue, and I think the policy makers and stakeholders and importantly the media by highlighting this is letting us know that there is an issue that we need to address when it comes to the education of our children and i think we must we must put a hand on the front corner to address this particular issue otherwise we'll be for the consequence mm. in the future sir so, let's just stay on this issue for a minute do you think the government is doing enough to drive down illiteracy in Nigeria? The, 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 well, um, one is, is to look at the budget. Two is to look at within your own environment and my own environment, how many primary schools or nursery and primary schools um, has government established in the last five years in my local government 
in my world, in yours, in my state, and in your neighborhood. If we take away the private sector involvement in the educational sector, the educational sector will have collapsed. You know, I used to tell my son this, that if I have to pay what, I, what I'm paying for him to go to school, if that's what my father had to pay, I won't go to school. I'm a product of private, a public school. I went to a public primary school, a public secondary school, a public university. But if you check majority of us, majority of our children went to private, private primary school, private secondary school, private university. And if you take away private participation, it, it will have collapsed. It will have, it, 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 it will have collapsed. The educational system will have collapsed. So talking that government is, whether government is doing enough or not, is there for everybody to see? Because how many primary schools have they established? How many secondary schools have they established in the last five years, in the last 10 years? What? So these are areas that cause for concern. So as far as I'm concerned, government is not doing enough at any level. Whether it's wow. local wow. government or the state or federal level. And it's as a result of us having um, centralization of the educational system. Mm -hmm. If you look at some of the Mr. things we call out Johnson. restructuring that people are talking, the major headline in all of the newspaper is about restructuring. You look at it, why should primary education be under the purview of the state government? Why should primary education not be under the local government? Give the local government the resources, give them the power to be the one in charge of primary schools, leave right. secondary schools for. Uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, where the challenge is with this thing. And we need to move on to something else because of time. But I think the challenge here is, you know, being able to understand how the government was able to enroll 3.2 million uh, uh, pupils in, into school in one year and seven months. Um, you know, what, what did they do different? In, in what ways were they able to get these kids back to school? And also, um, you know, what is the likelihood that these kids will stay in school? Remember that we've also been in a pandemic in, the, in more than a year. And so what schools, in, in what ways were they able to achieve this, in, even during a pandemic? But we don't have that more time. Maybe if it comes up in another paper, uh, we'll talk about that. I'll, I'll quickly also speak on the conversation on restructuring again. Um, it says there that Jonathan Jagar Mwodo and um, Ogbe disagree on restructuring. Um, in, in, in a minute, please, so we can move on. We do not uh, south divide or the religious divide that permeates our society. The structure has to do with structural adjustment in our system of governance. It's about power sharing process, giving responsibility to various constituent unit of, of, of the nation. And whether we like it or not, we we'll still go there because Nigeria in principle claims to be federalism, which talks about structure of power being shared among three structures, the local government, the state government, and the federal government. Now, but in practice, Nigeria is a unitary state and not a federal state because there are three basic lists when you talk about power centers, about structures. You have the exclusive list, which is the item which only the federal government could legislate on. You have the concurrent list, which only the only both federal government and state government could legislate on. And then you have the residual list, which only the state government could legislate on. Unfortunately, in Nigeria, most of the items in the constitution are under the exclusive list. I ask you why should railway be under exclusive list? I ask you why should telecommunication be under exclusively. Why should port ownership and operation be on that exclusive list? So we are just still playing lip service to it. Whether we will still come down, it has become a recurrent feature because All people right. feel that, you know what, there's too much power in the center. Devolve this power. Let's share this power among the state and the local government. Now let's even come to the state and the local government. In many states in Nigeria, they've not conducted any election at the local government level since December 1998, when they when we had the universal local government election, there was the transition to the fourth republic. We don't have okay. any election right, at the Johnson. local government level. What we have are sole administration. 
is an aberration in a democratic society. All so right. whether Mr. Jekka Johnson. will do, I very, very disagree with it, is, is the reality of time. Whether we like, it's a Frankenstein monster hanging around this nation. And the earlier we deal with it, the better. For the Kuka race of EU, they said he was trying to plan coup. Now, some weeks after he raised the issue, mm, former president Jonathan INEC chairman are uh, talking about oh, agreeing or disagreeing on instruction. Let us continue the disagreement and the agreement. All right. All right. Uh, Jilly Johnson, this, this big issue is still on the front page of the Punch newspaper where we're going to right now. It says, call for restructuring, go to National Assembly. Presidency tells ACF, Uodo Adebanjo, as agitation spreads. It says, restructuring absolutely necessary to deal with problems confronting us. And that's according to Ogwe. And only National Assembly, not Buhari, can restructure Nigeria. So the presidency is telling agitators to take their agitation to the National Assembly, saying they're only... Uh, the, the only one who has the power to do so. But moving on from that issue, we see this one on the front page of the Punch newspaper. NGF distances governors from Bellows' comments on COVID-19. U.S. in-flight passengers will present COVID-19 results, and that's according to Biden. FG releases 6.45 billion naira to establish 38 oxygen tanks. FG contracts over 900 million railway e-ticketing service to concessionaire. Court jails Ondo Pastor for trying to, for lying against church founder. All right, nothing wrong with godfathers in Nigerian politics, and that's according to the minister, as well as this one saying Southwest governors should employ laws to cage killer herdsmen. Machawali threatens crackdown on politicians as Zamfara bandits kill 19. Drunk cop killed my two children with APC. And that's according to a housewife in Oshun State. And knows exactly his wife contracts COVID-19, undergoes treatment in prison. Um, Mr. Dida Johnson, let's have you back for a minute to uh, share your thoughts on one of the stories on the punch. Well, um... Will you have to take COVID-19 for federal government to establish oxygen plant? If you go to our teaching hospitals and various hospitals, some of the challenges we have at the hospital prior to COVID-19 are people looking for oxygen. And then we have one of the most abundant and um, liquefied um, natural gas in Nigeria. So government now saying that they are establishing that shows how, what and what we place priority on and how we don't know how to plan. Um, for, for 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 the future. So for me, it's a welcome development, but it's a step in the right direction. We shouldn't have waited up till now before we went ahead um, with this a particular and a situation whereby we even have um, a governor denying the existence of um, of of COVID and going ahead to talk about uh, a conspiracy theory concerning the vaccine uh, that. The governor of Kogisti, that's why the Nigerian governor's forum disassociated themselves from, from, from his comment. Leadership is about taking responsibility. And one of uh, the challenges we have in our part of the world is that we don't hold leaders accountable. They must be accountable to the people. They must be accountable to the oath of office, the, the swear before getting into office. They must be accountable to the promises they made before coming into power. And um, well, <laughs> I'm not surprised when, let me go to this particular issue which we have also spoken about. I'm not surprised by the reaction of the president saying that people should go to the National Assembly if they want restructuring. It's the deception of the progressive ideology. Um, throughout the campaign, if you look at just in just two days, um, the, president, the president of the United States of America that said throughout the campaign tree, I'm not banning fracking, I'm not fracking, there's no more, there will be no ban on fracking or no fracking. Just yesterday, he signed an executive order banning fracking. The APC is a party that ran on restructuring. If the party ran, it was built on restructuring, and it is the party that is living in this self denial concerning restructuring. So, uh, we should hold them accountable, hold them accountable to promises. If the president said so yesterday that they should go to the National Assembly, I think we need to dig deep and go back to what he said in the past. Mr. President, you said this, you said this, you said this, you said this, concerning restructuring. 
So until we hold them accountable, they will just be playing to gallery. They would say they will say something and do something else, and they will just speak to the moment, not to the real issue, because they will just tell us what they feel part time, not what they believe in and what they have said. So, all right, holding them accountable is some of the things in which you can make our leadership responsible in Africa. Okay, um, because, of because of time, let's quickly move to the uh, Guardian newspapers. Um, and see what we can also find over there. We have a few minutes left. Uh, it says that the federal government and states allocate less than 5% to agriculture. Um, also on the Guardian, tackle insecurity n now before it's too late, Alafin tells uh, uh, President Buhari. Uh, we can also see on the Guardian, let constitution amendment reflect people's wishes, Jonathan tells National Assembly. And a Kano court orders retrial of condemned Sharif who uh, rather and uh, also acquits jailed Umar. Um, if you remember the two persons who were sentenced, uh, one of them to death, another to 10 years imprisonment, a 13 year old boy who was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment uh, for uh, blasphemy. And uh, of course, um, uh, Aminu Yahya who was sentenced to death for blasphemy also. A uh, court has um, ordered a retrial and of course um, thrown out the other case. Um, we also find here, PGF and Ondo Monarchs back quit notice to criminal headsmen. Um, Abuad uh, rec records a breakthrough to develop products for new strain of COVID-19. Uh, because of time, let's quickly speak on the, of course, the Kano uh, court judgment. Um, if we have uh, time, we can squeeze in another one. Mr. Johnson, uh, go ahead with that one. Uh, nation, in terms of operating federal system. What type of um, legal system exists in the North? You have a situation that have a country that has two legal systems. You have the penal code and the criminal code. You use the penal code in the North, we use the criminal code in the South. So some something you can do in the South and go scot-free. You can't try in the North, vice versa. So is that a nation? It's, it's food for thought for those that work in the, in, in the judicial in the judicial sector and for major stakeholders in the judicial sector we don't have the same code as uh, in our adjudicatory um, judicial um, system so well it's good that they have responded to public opinion that the issue will be tried again you have the east bar police in the north and then you can't have community policing in the south we just nigeria is a contraction of contradiction it's just a contraction of contradiction only god we help us, but God will not come down to help us until we sit down and talk about this thing on the table. And that's why I keep clamoring for restructuring. Now, let me go to the story on agriculture. Five percent on agriculture. Mm. Any nation that is not equipped to feed itself will be a perpetual beggar. Five percent on agriculture. The agriculture used to be the mainstay of our economy, the strength of our nation, the foundation of this nation was built on agriculture. When agriculture used to contribute 70 to 80% of our gross domestic product, what has happened to that? And what are we doing concerning that? The first global economic crisis recorded in mankind history was resolved through an aggressive, all-inclusive agrarian policy when Joseph was the prime minister in Egypt under the Pharaoh's administration. Now, we, what steps are we taking to feed ourselves? 5% on agriculture, and you look at other percentage on the emoluments and salaries of political office holders. Oh my goodness. We are not ready for, we are not ready for change. We are not ready for progress because we must make constructive investment in agriculture. We must make direct investment in, in education. And two of the stories which we have spoken about, which are critical sector towards growing your economy, those sectors are underfunded. And one, government is playing to the gallery, saying that they enroll students under pandemic. God will help us. So, so, what, so what does this say about our plans to diversify our economy? Uh, that's one of the things that the, in the current administration... If we really want to uh, diversify the economy, why don't we go back to the basic? Send the people back to the farm. I remember while we were in primary school,
I'm not sure my son knows about it. I'm not sure children of these days knows about it. That we used to sing the song we sing in in during our assembly. Farming is our culture, is our tradition. It is the trade of our nation. Whoever does not farm and whoever does not work, we steal. It was instilled as part of the value system. You know, when during primary school, those that are in my generation will relate to it. Iwekiko, Laisioko. Going to school, embracing Western education without your farm tool is just a waste of time. They have built on those value systems. You know, the unfortunate thing, it is people in my generation and the older generation that are at the ends of affairs now. But unfortunately, while I was still in secondary school, the president was the head of state. Now that I've graduated, I've left university, I'm working, the same person that was president, head of state, while I was in secondary school, is the same person that is the president, and we are expecting change. It's the same thing with America. In fact, shortly after I was giving back to, Joe Biden was elected as a senator. He was in government for a very long time. He's been elected now, and people are expecting change. They are all deceiving themselves. It has shown that democracy is just government of the elite. And they go about using the media and all other means in the society to manipulate public opinion to thank suit... You, thank you, Mr. Johnson. To suit... Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very Johnson. much for your um, time. And you, you it's, a pleasure, it's a pleasure to be with you. <laughs> so, so change the way experience <laughs> in Nigeria and in America. We are experiencing our own change. I hope you right. experience their own change too. Thank well, you. Let, let's see how it goes. Thank you. Looking forward to speaking with you again. All right, and of course, have a great Friday. I forgot it's a Friday, so thank God yes, it's Friday. Yes, it's a Friday. The week is um, running so fast. The month is going to end in just a couple of days. Yes, it will. And we're going to be saying happy Valentine's Day in just a few. <laughs> great energy to kick off, you know, the yes. show this morning on a Friday morning. We hope that we keep this going all through the day. Uh, that was G.D. Johnson with uh, Off the Press. Uh, we're going to be talking about what happened today in history next and uh, telling you about a person called uh, Lyndon Baines uh, Johnson. Uh, of course, uh, now we're uh, having loads of conversations about the United States presidents. Uh, it's a great time to talk about him. So stay with us. It's coming up next.